Can everybody hear me? Oh, awesome. I have to apologize. I kind of lost my voice, so this is not what I normally sound like. So uh, yeah, that's all. So I think, first of all, I'd like to extend a huge note of gratitude to Eugenia and to Brian for inviting me to speak here. And this is a huge honor, and I very much value being a part of the Caltech family. And so thanks to all of you for spending this beautiful afternoon inside so that you can come and hear some of our stories. So you've been sta staring at this title long enough now, and it says the importance of not being a bad scientist. Those of you who like theater, the idea here is that it's the importance of being earnest, but I'm not sure if maybe, yeah. Anyway, so of course, this is all said in jest. It's important not to be a bad scientist. So I think all of us have different trajectories for how we became scientists. How many of you are scientists in the audience? Some, okay, that's great. Well, those of us who are, you can probably relate to it. We all have different trajectories of how, of how we got here. The way I got here is that, first of all, I'm actually an immigrant, so my family moved to the US when I was in high school, and then I kept on hearing various family members telling me, you could never get into MIT, it's very hard to get into MIT, so don't even worry about it. And then I heard, you're never gonna get into grad school. And then, when I was in grad school, I heard, you know, you're a bad scientist, and I don't think that women should get PhDs in general. So now I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from MIT, I have a PhD from Stanford, and I'm a chaired full professor here at Caltech. Of <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Of all things that begin with an M, but of material science, mechanical engineering, and medical engineering, I'm also a mom and a musician, so I guess math is gonna be next uh, pursuit. So one thing that good scientists do is we ask questions. We always ask questions and we never settle. And so I want to share with you a little bit about the kinds of questions we ask in my group. So this is the largest stone man-made monument. This is the Great Pyramid of Giza. It stands 150 meters tall. It's very, very tall, right? And it weighs six million tons. So this is like six giant airplanes. This is very, very, very heavy. And so that brings to question, do we have to make structures that are so, so heavy? Because the airplanes, of course, they're extremely heavy, and therefore it's very expensive to fly them because it takes a tremendous amount of fuel to propel them through the air, right? Well, so let's look at the engineered structure. This is probably something most of you are familiar with. In fact, I know some of you have been here before. This is the Eiffel Tower. It stands twice as tall, 324 meters tall, and it weighs three orders of magnitude less a thousand times less. And it's very mechanically robust. It's been there for forever. So what that teaches us is that things don't have to be so heavy if you're clever about how you engineer them. So that was our question. Now, what we do in our group is we apply this concept of architecture, like buildings, to material design. What you're looking at here is the world's most normal dandelion and a nickel micro lattice that's sitting on top of it. And you can see that it's hardly perturbing it at all. So in fact, if I were to hold one of these nickel micro lattices in one hand and the feather in the other and to release them at the same time, the feather would fall down faster because these are extremely lightweight, just like the Eiffel Tower versus the Great Pyramid of Giza. But there's one more requirement that the Eiffel Tower has to have besides being lightweight. What is it? Strong. strong. That's right. These things are not strong. They're sitting on top of dandelions and that's all really nice but they're not strong. You can just crush it with your hands. To get to that strength together with the lightweight, you have to go down three more orders of magnitude in dimensions to get to the nanoscale. This is something, a nanoscale is one billionth of a meter. All of these structures that you see here, all of these architected materials that you see were made by students in my group. And those of you who like Doctor Who, here's a micro TARDIS. And this thing is about one thousandth of your hair diameter. And we made one like that. You can see that these are very, very open cellular solids. You can see that they're interwoven networks of effectively straws. These beams are hollow. When you look at the image here, the wall thickness here may be on the order of 10 nanometers. Again, that's 10 billionths of a meter. So when, you, when this material sits on your hand, it looks like a solid cloud. And when you zoom in, the largest dimension is at the nanoscale. Well, things are very, very different at the nanoscale. Here's, I'm gonna show you a plot. And those of you who are not scientists, don't worry, I'll walk you through this. <coughs> Let's look at some common metals. So what are your earrings made out of, ladies? Metal, what kind of metal? Very good, sterling silver is good. Gold, right? Okay, if we take gold and we plot the strength of gold 
as a function of its dimensions. Say you have your earring, and then you keep on reducing, 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 dividing it in half. At some point, you're going to get to that nanoscale, right? Not quite atoms yet, but nanoscale. And it's going to get super strong. It's going to get much, much stronger. It's going to become as strong as steel. And we know gold to be very malleable, right? OK, so smaller can be stronger. Now, let's look at the same metals, but we're going to, to create them, make them, using a different technique. And so now, all of a sudden, we're looking at this effect, and it's reversed. Smaller, all of a sudden, is weaker. So we're thinking about this, we're like, oh, so it's the same metal, but now the atoms are arranged differently. And now the dimensions can be used as a tuning criterion, right? So we can make them weaker or stronger. But actually, at the nanoscale, things are even more interesting than that. I'm going to show you what happens to glass at the nanoscale. When you take a metal rod, uh, not a metal, sorry, a glass rod, and you pull on it or try to bend it, what do you expect to happen? It'll shatter and break, right? So I'm going to show you a metal rod, uh, again, keep on saying metal, a glass rod, glass, glass rod, that we're going to, onto which we're going to pull, but it's only 150 nanometers in diameter. And watch what happens to it. So we're pulling. Believe it or not, this is a movie. We're pulling on it, and this is the data that we're collecting. This kind of a plot is called data, so we're measuring how far it's extending. This is the measure how far it's extending. And I'm not sure if you saw this or not, but we're able to extend it by a long, stretch it. Glass is not supposed to stretch, but this guy is stretching because he's a nano glass. Now, when you look at this complicated structure, a very complex structure, this is made out effectively of chalk, very, very brittle ceramic. And what we're going to do now is we're going to push on it. And watch what happens. Each one of these beams is bending. Can you imagine bending a piece of chalk? What happens to a piece of chalk if you bend it? It snaps. Wait, I look, I'll show you. <laughs> this is what that thing is, but very, very small. But that's not fracturing. This guy's laughing at us. He is able to deform and to bend to such high stresses that no ceramic is able to stay intact. But this one is. So the key takeaway, this is what happens when you're a good scientist. You ask questions. You don't just take whoever's word for it that chalk is supposed to break. So here's the takeaway point here. Sometimes materials get stronger. Sometimes they can get weaker. Sometimes you can prevent their failure. But all of these effects emerge only at the nanoscale. So the next question we asked was, can we somehow use that nano effect? Because you can't see, you can't touch it. You can, I can tell you, hey, I have a whole bunch of nano pillars here. You can't prove me wrong. So can we make bigger materials, but with the same properties? So that's how we do it. We apply that concept of architecture, and then we make bigger materials out of tiny, tiny little nano Lego blocks. So this is a special nano lattice that we made whose wall thing, remember I told you about the straws? So the thickness of that wall is 50 nanometers, 50 billionths of a meter. I don't know what it is in centimeters, but it's, uh, I mean in inches, but it's very, very small. So it's about 100 thousandths of your hair diameter. That's the wall thickness. So imagine your coffee mug with a severe case of osteoporosis, okay? So big, big holes, very, very brittle walls, very, very thin, and we're going to push on it. What do you think is gonna happen? It's gonna crack and crash and, and burn and maybe not burn, but die for short. So here it, here it is, we're loading it from above, and it crushes and it dies just like this, this uh, young scientist predicted, and pff, we have like a little nano cemetery in our lab. <laughs> totally gone. <clears throat> crushes and dies, right? So now, we're going to repeat this experiment. We're gonna leave everything else the same, and the only thing we're going to do is reduce the wall thickness. It's no longer 50 nanometers, now it's going to be 10 nanometers. So even more osteoporosis, even weaker walls, even more brittle, so it should shatter even more readily, right? Ceramic, very, very, think a piece of, again, your coffee mug, right? So watch what happens. It's deforming, and it's gonna snap at any moment now, right? Just like the other guy did. It's very, very brittle ceramic, right? So it's gonna break right now, right now. It thinks it's a sponge. <laughs> Ceramics at the nanoscale think that they're sponges. What, what's wrong with you? Well, hold on, let's repeat it on a whole, I'm sure it's just a fluke, right? So let's create a very complicated geometry. What does this remind you of? A coral. A coral. That's an excellent suggestion. Anything, anybody else? What do you think? Yeah, that's right. A wood, yeah, I was thinking somebody would say wood, right? Doesn't it look kind of like wood? So very, very not symmetric, like that guy. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna push on them both. And look what they're doing. They all think that they're sponges. And they're all very, very brittle ceramics. 
you can't trick them. This is a very real effect. So this is called thinking outside the box. We don't have to make them be periodic. Does everybody know what the word periodic means? They don't have to repeat the same part over and over and over. They can be totally random. And they don't have to have exactly the same pattern. For example, if you look at this guy, he's much denser at the top and much lower density at the bottom. And now what you see when he's deforming is that the first, this is the part that deforms first, and then the part, that part doesn't even know that he's being compressed. So you can now think of materials as completely modular. You create completely different architectures, completely different geometries. Look at this. This is a fractal one where each beam is now made out of self-similar unit cells. And watch what happens to this guy. This one is going to kink. Oh my gosh, this kind of hurts me every time I watch this video. It's <laughs> kinking and we're expecting it to break right at these corners, right, right here, right there. Very brittle ceramic. So that's nano size effect for you ladies and gentlemen. If you didn't question, if you weren't a good scientist and just believed what you saw, you would never ever discover these kinds of things. So we decided that we wanted to play with these materials a lot more. So what is it that frusts you, frustrates you the most about your phones? Battery time. That you have to charge them all the time. And your iPads, all of your little electronic devices constantly run out of battery. And it's so frustrating. But we have reasons to believe that these might be really good batteries. So here's what we did. <coughs> we created this, this kind of a structure, three-dimensional, and you're looking at it from the top. And what happens in a battery? Where's, where are my young scientists here? OK, you've already answered a lot of questions. Is there a young scientist who knows how batteries work? There's a young scientist right there. All right, how does a battery work? You, you, You know, I only have 15 minutes. And it other wires that are laying without That's right, but what are those wires conducting? So that they're like some kind of big screws make your phone and then all of these together make electricity. You are right. All right, thank you. That was thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> That's exactly right. So in a battery, you make electricity. And the way you make electricity is you're, you're um, shuttling these bigger um, things that are called ions. So it's kind of like an atom, but an atom that lost its electron to the electricity, donated for the good cause. So when the ions, and these are special lithium ions, go into one of these lattices, look what happens. So we're actually pushing the, li the lithium ions through it right now. And watch what it's doing. It's forming these little, I call them violin type patterns. It's forming these little patterns. And in fact, what happened it was, was that it went from these straight rectangles into these violin-shaped patterns. We didn't know this was going to happen. This is called buckling. So they buckled in and out convex and concave and it formed these structures. And so we said, well, wait a minute. Oh, just to show you, this is in fact a real battery. See, we're charging and discharging, char just in case you think these are pretty pictures. It is a real battery. So we said, wait a minute, it's all about defects. So what we can do is we can look at what happens inside of a battery. How many, how many of you have ever seen what happens inside of a battery? It turns out that you actually, all of these ions have to go somewhere. So I'm going to show you what happens to all these ions. So they're going to the surface of a current collector, and they open up these big places, and then lithium starts growing out of it. it they look like worms. They look gross. But that's what happens in every single one of your iPhones. Yeah, see, this guy thinks that he's all that. He's really growing a lot. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, now it's going to be grow. Now you're not going to want a phone anymore. <laughs> right. So this is, I, I'd like to maybe um, finish with this. So we realize that defects, you know, have you ever heard this expression, you call a flaw, call it a feature? Yeah, so we took these defects and we said, hey, defects are actually really interesting, just like people, materials. It, it, the, the defects in materials is what makes them interesting. So watch what's going to happen. So this is one of those electrodes in a battery, and we pre-programmed some defects in them. And all we're going to do now is shove a whole bunch of lithium into it and, and just, make, just, just let it function as a battery. And watch what happens. What do you see? <laughs> Yeah, maybe you see some resemblance right here. So my student, Xiaoxing, just did this a few weeks ago because we realized we can use defects to our advantage. Um, anyways, I'd probably a good time for me to summarize everything. So I hope that 
when you walk out of here, you're going to hear amazing, amazing talks. And if there's one thing you remember about my talk, I'd like to, you to, to remember three things. Okay, three. You can all do three? The first one is that it's very important to understand how the atoms are arranged in your material. If you're going to be a material scientist, which of course all of you are, um, <laughs> it's very important to understand the nature of the atoms in your material. The second thing is it's very important that you understand the nano size effect. Don't believe anybody who tells you there's no nano size effect or everything is exactly how it is at, in the large macro scale world. Actually, things are very different and often upside down at the nano scale. And the third one is the particular architecture you decide to make. Maybe it's the Eiffel Tower. Maybe it's uh, one of these TARDISes. Maybe it's this fractal or a flower or something like that. But if you combine these three things in a clever way, you can make entirely new materials that we haven't even thought of yet. And those of you who are younger, the younger generation right now, maybe you could live in the world where instead of hearing aids, we could just write the cochlea bone and implant it directly in your ear, because we can. It's the right scale, it's the right complexity. Your iPhone 83 is gonna hold its charge for a year without needing to be recharged. The balloons will no longer have to be filled with helium because vacuum is lighter than air. So you can just evacuate the air out of your balloons that are made out of nano lattices, and that's going to happen. Your Christmas ornaments, of course, will never shatter. <laughs> and this is our current most exciting pursuit. So you were outside. You probably all got cookies or some kind of a yummy brownish type thing in your lunches. So here's what we're working on right now. Chocolate nano lattices, which are 100% taste, 99.9% .9 air, and 0.01% <laughs> calories. <laughs> <laughs> so I really have to acknowledge my group. This is all, I get to come, out, come and fly all over the world and present these talks, but it's really my amazing students who yeah, you can see working very hard on the beach here. Uh, they did the work. These are all the funding sources that supported us. And there's going to be a quiz afterwards. I want to walk you through about how not to be a bad scientist. So the first advice I have for you is stay hungry and stay curious. You can't lose that curiosity. The moment you settle, you're going to be a bad scientist. And nobody wants that, right? You always question what you read and what you observe. Don't just take the answer and don't just form an answer. Always be willing to ask. Know and respect what's been done before because you can't be obnoxious. All of these things sound like you might be obnoxious. You, can only, you only get to question once you know what everybody has done before those before. Develop tools to hold your own and to be a colleague. That goes with respect, okay? Everything in science is done in a respectful and not personal way. Persevere even when others don't think you can do it. And that's how you get the Nobel Prize. If you look at the stories of any Nobel Prize winner, and my very good friend Francis Arnold actually just got one. If you look at anybody's story, people didn't believe in what they were doing. People caused, said, there are no quasi-crystals, there are only quasi-scientists. That's what Linus Pauling said uh, about Daniel Shetman's uh, discovery, who later on, of course, got the Nobel Prize. And most importantly, don't always believe what your advisor says. So. <laughs> Thank you.